I worked as a park ranger in Missouri for several years. I've been working for the state of Missouri since 2008, and I love my job. My wife is from here, and we have a beautiful home in the country. I am writing to you because of an incident that happened on my watch, and I have no idea what it was, but it was not a bear. I've been in the woods all my life. This was unlike anything I've ever seen before. It happened on October 1st, 2022, at a park in the southern part of Missouri. I was patrolling a state park when it happened. It was around 9.30 or so. I had just turned on my headlights and was moving down the trail, and I heard something very large coming up behind me. It sounded like it was a person. I heard two legs, but I did not hear any accompanying footsteps or even branches or leaves crumbling. I turned around, shined my light in the direction of where it was coming from, but I saw nothing. Whatever it was sounded like it stopped just before it got to me. I turned back around, continued walking, but whatever it was sounded as if it was following me. It sounded like it stopped again when I stopped, then started up again when I started walking. It continued this for about a mile until I reached the end of my patrol route and was heading back. When I got close to my truck, I heard it stop again. It was like something or someone was watching me, but never saw anything. Once I got in my vehicle, I turned on my headlights and I looked around but didn't see anything again, even though I could hear it breathing. Then, started the truck and headed back to my office. When I got there, it was now about 10.45. I got out of the truck and began walking toward my office when, I kid you not, something large and heavy hit me right in the back. With so much force, it physically knocked me to the ground. It was like a rock or something hit me. I quickly got up, turned around. There was nothing. Confused and agitated, I walked into my office, sat down at my desk to write a report. I was still in shock from what had happened, and I had a coworker come in and ask me if I was okay. I told him I was fine, that something had hit me hard enough to knock the wind out of me. They told me that it didn't sound like a rock. I also told him I didn't feel anything, but that I felt something was wrong. He asked me if I wanted to go to the hospital. I declined. He told me that he would fill out the report and not to worry about it. So I went home after work. I talked to my wife about what had happened. I told her that something had hit me in the back and knocked me to the ground, but didn't see what it was. She asked if I wanted to go to the doctor, even though she said she was going to make me an appointment with our family physician. Fast forward to about a week later. I was at work and one of my fellow co-workers came into the office. He said that he had something to show me, but it couldn't leave this room. I told him I had no idea what he was talking about. He looked at me sternly. You remember the night you were hit in the back and knocked to the ground? I told him, yeah, I did. He said, with a very serious expression, I have something to show you. And so he pulls out his cell phone and shows me a video of what he had captured that night. It was over at a different section of the park. It was a video of what he had witnessed. And the tree line near where our office is located is what appeared to be a strange canine creature. It was on all fours, but its face was horrifyingly human-like. He said that as he was walking to his truck when it appeared out of nowhere, he said it tried to attack him. He also explained how the creature was able to get up on two legs and move toward him, and when it did so, it made a wet popping sound. It stopped about 20 feet away. He said that he was scared and quickly got into his truck then drove off to get help from another ranger in the park who had a radio. He drove back to the area and found nothing. I told him it was not a bear, but what is it? We have no idea. I asked him if he had shown anybody else the video. He said no. He told me that it was for my eyes only, but wanted to show me because he was concerned about my well-being. I expressed to him that I didn't think it was a bear, but what is it? Him and I both have no idea.
I used to be a ranger at Yosemite National Park in the early 1990s. I had been assigned to work in the backcountry and surrounding areas and wilderness of Yosemite. The first four years or so were spent working inside the park, and then I moved into an area known as Tuolumne Meadows. I spent a lot of time in this area and was very familiar with just about every trailhead and backcountry campsite in that region alone. I had been working there for about five months when I started hearing stories about what some people called the Yosemite werewolf. Local Native Americans told me it was real and to be very careful if you ever encountered one because they were known to actually eat people who got lost or stranded out there. But I just thought it was all riffraff, just noise, nonsensical noise. I had never encountered anything being a ranger, nothing that even leaned toward the realm of supernatural. No missing bodies, no blood, no werewolf claws. So, as you can imagine, this was definitely eye-opening. These natives also told me that these creatures lived in small caves high up on the mountain ledges, deep inside rock formations where most humans couldn't even reach without using ropes and climbing gear. Again, I dismissed these stories as folklore. I had been raised in the mountains of Northern California. I was also an avid outdoors enthusiast all my life. I knew that there were bears, mountain lions, and other animals, but never thought about a dog-like creature existing up here, even at this altitude. It would be impossible for a canine, especially a bipedal one at that, to live so high up. I started hearing more stories over time from different sources while working outside on patrol or during backcountry training sessions with other rangers who also worked in the area. We kept hearing how people were starting to see things out of nowhere, but they could not prove they existed. This was until we got a report from one of our own park employees who saw something just south of Tioga Pass Road. This was also in a part of the thick wilderness area. I heard a story from an older ranger who had been there since the 70s. He told me how he and a group of other rangers were out on patrol one night near this particular area and they came across what looked like a large dog-like creature eating a carcass. They said it was dark, but they saw this thing standing over the dead animal, ripping pieces off of it with its teeth and claws, just the same way a human would rip meat off an animal. He stated that it stood about eight feet tall, with exceptionally long arms that hung down to just above its knees, covered in dark fur, and a long, round, wolfish face. It was more human-looking than anything else. I took what he had to tell me to heart. After all, I did greatly respect him as a ranger, and he wasn't the type of person to be creating fabricated tales. I never saw anything myself, but stories kept popping up and popping up. Eventually, I had a career switch in the mid to late 90s, so I never got to see what all the fuss was about. But then again, I don't think I want to. In 1996, I worked for a few years in the Parks and Recreation Services in Idaho State. I was a ranger for a time as well, and also spent some of my time keeping people out of the illegal areas of the wilderness, including national forests, lakes, rivers, and streams, as well as state game lands. I would say that at least once a month, we had to investigate reports of Bigfoot sightings from people around the area. The most common report of Bigfoot sightings is that somebody would have heard something walking through their yard at night or their campsite. They would also look outside but can never see anything because it was dark. These people often reported hearing heavy footsteps only feet away from their camper. Very strange. People would also report a strange, eerie feeling in your gut, telling you something isn't right. One particular case sticks out in my mind because it was so strange. In 98, I got called into work one night after midnight on a Sunday morning to meet with two rangers who were already working at Bear Lake State Park, along with several deputies from the county sheriff's department to investigate a supposed sighting. Bear Lake is one of the largest freshwater lakes in the western United States, and 
don't quote me on this, but I believe it is the second largest lake right next to the Utah Lake. All of us rangers had been called to an area that we all referred to it as the Point. There was a large campground with about 20 campsites that were occupied by people, just vacationing for several weeks or hanging out during their summer break. Several people that we had talked to reported seeing something walking around outside their tent that was much larger than any man, and they were scared. They said it kept pacing up and down through each campsite, making loud noises and whooping sounds, but nobody ever saw anything because it was so dark outside. They just heard heavy, raspy breathing from someone they claimed smoked 20 packs a day. They also, at least a few of them, reported a very foul smell, like raw sewage and urine. The deputies reported that they had never smelt anything like this before, and some of the rangers claimed it was the worst smell they had ever encountered. The deputies did not know what to make of all these reports, so they called for backup from the state parks department to investigate further. The deputy who first responded stated that he began investigating and saw something large moving towards the campground. When he yelled at it and tried to shine a flashlight on it, he didn't find anything, but he kept hearing noises the entire night that left him chilled. He also noticed a foul odor coming from within several tents, which made him feel uneasy. He would quickly return back towards his patrol car, parked down by the lake shore. Another deputy arrived. Both men decided to search around the campground after dark with flashlights, looking for anything unusual, such as footprints or any signs of an intruder being present, since nothing else seemed unusual, except those reports about hearing strange noises at night while trying to sleep. One particular report stood out among others. There was one camper who refused multiple requests by law enforcement officers throughout the night to check his tent so they could see if he was okay. The camper refused to come out of his tent, and even when deputies asked him several times, he kept saying no. He was scared. He was thinking that that thing was out there and was going to grab him. After several hours of convincing, around 4.30 in the morning, he decided to come out, and you could tell he was completely petrified. Apparently, this area had been a hotbed for sightings and strange things. We then spent several hours walking around Bear Lake, looking for any signs, but found nothing. Just lots of tracks left behind by deer with other strange animals. We did find some prints leading down towards the point where people were camping, but these looked similar enough that they could have been made by humans wearing boots, not necessarily large Bigfoot tracks. And that's about the extent of my sightings. I know it's nothing crazy, but those are the things we experienced. And this went on for a few more years, but fortunately, I never had to see anything. I had been looking forward to this trip for months. A chance to get away from the hustle and bustle of the city and spend some quality time in nature with some of my closest friends. We had planned a hike in the Shawnee National Forest, a place we had never been to before but had heard so many great things about. As we made our way through the thick forest, hiking off the beaten path and trails, we laughed and joked, taking in the beauty of the trees and the sound of the nearby river. Our backpacks were heavy with food and gear, but we were all in good spirits, excited for the adventure ahead. When we finally found the perfect spot to set up camp, we were exhausted, but happy. We set up our tents, started a fire, cooking dinner and sharing stories of our past camping adventures. But as the sun began to set and darkness soon enveloped the forest, things started to take a strange turn. It started with a strange and out of place buzzing noise it seemed to be coming from all around us, and our heads began to throb with pain. At first, we thought it just might be our imagination, or perhaps the result of the long hike we had just completed, perhaps dehydration. But the buzzing persisted, growing louder and more intense 
until we could barely think properly. And then, one by one, we all started to lose consciousness. I awoke the next morning with a pounding headache and a sense of disorientation. I looked around, saw that my friends were all slowly waking up as well, looking just as confused and scared as I was. We all knew that something was very wrong. Something had happened to us last night, something that we could not explain or understand. But we were all too afraid to talk about it, too afraid to acknowledge what had happened. Instead, we decided to go on a hike to try and clear our minds, put the strange events of the previous night behind us. We packed up our things and headed off into the forest, still feeling uneasy and on edge. The hike was beautiful, the rugged terrain lush and green, but the sense of unease and the lingering headaches didn't dissipate, even as we hiked further and further away from our campsite. Now, eventually, we came across a large clearing by a stream. The clearing felt different from the rest of the forest. There was this inexplicable feeling of static electricity in the air and a strange sensation that we all felt throughout our bodies. It was like the forest was trying to tell us something, but we could not quite make out what it was. We spent some time in the clearing, taking in the beautiful scenery, trying to shake off any unease that was creeping up on us. But eventually, we all agreed that it was time to head back to our campsite. The hike back was long and arduous, we were all feeling more and more tired and disoriented as we made our way back through the dense woods. It was like the air was getting thicker, harder to breathe, and the buzzing sensation had grown stronger, almost deafening. None of us said anything, but we all felt it. Something was happening, something that we couldn't explain or understand. It was like the forest was alive, it was trying to warn us of something but we were too scared to listen. As we finally made it back, we all felt a sense of relief. We cooked some dinner and tried to relax, but the events of the previous night and the strange sensations we had been feeling all day made it impossible to let our guard down. That night, we all turned in early, hoping to get some rest and to put the strange events of the past few days behind us. But as I lie there in my tent, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was wrong. It was there, like somebody was watching us, something waiting to pounce. In the middle of the night, we were awoken by a loud crashing sound. We all jumped out of our tents, confused and scared, trying to figure out what was happening. We searched for the source of the noise, but we couldn't find anything. Then we heard something. A strange, pulsating sound that was growing stronger and stronger, like a heartbeat that was getting faster and faster. It was coming from all around us, but we could not pinpoint where it was coming from. We were overcome with abject terror. None of us could sleep. The night felt endless as we lay in our tents, just listening to the pulsating sound that seemed to be coming closer and closer, then dissipate. None of us slept a wink, and by the time the sun began to rise, we were all exhausted and scared. As we emerged from our tents, we could all see that something had changed. The forest looked different, as if it had been distorted somehow. It was like we were seeing it through a different lens, and everything had taken on an otherworldly quality. We were all feeling nauseous and we could hear the buzzing and pulsating sound in the air around us. It was like the forest had come alive overnight, and it was trying to tell us something. We all knew that something was very wrong. We decided to go on a hike to try and clear our minds, and get away from the strange sensations. We hiked for hours, the terrain getting rougher and more rugged as we made our way deeper and deeper into the woods. But despite the beauty of our surroundings, we all felt like something was off, like we were walking through a dream. And we came across another clearing, similar to the one we had found the day before, but this one was larger. 
At this point in my memory, it felt like we were just puppets. As we stepped into the clearing, we all felt the same buzzing and pulsating sensations that we had felt before, only this time much stronger. We could all hear a faint sound coming from underground, like the sound of machinery or grinding gears. It was faint, but it was definitely there. We felt like we were standing in the middle of some kind of machine, like we were part of something much larger than ourselves. We stayed in the clearing for a while, trying to make sense of everything, but eventually, we all agreed it was time to leave. We felt like we were being watched and followed, like we were intruding on something that we should not be a part of. As we hiked back to our campsite, we all breathed a sigh of relief. We knew something had changed. The forest was no longer the same as it was when we had first arrived. It was like we had awoken something, and it was now awake and watching us. We didn't speak much on the hike back, too afraid to acknowledge the strange events of the past few days. But we all felt like we were being followed, like something was tracking our every move. And as we finally made it back to our campsite, we all felt like we were in the middle of a nightmare that we could not escape. That night, we all gathered around the campfire, still feeling uneasy and scared from the strange events of the past few days. None of us spoke much. The conversation was stilted and awkward. It was like the forest had gotten under our skin, like it was trying to drive us apart. We all felt like something terrible was about to happen, like we were in the middle of a nightmare that we could not escape from. As the night wore on, we all began to feel more and more uneasy. We could hear strange noises in the distance, like the sound of machinery and gears. We felt like we were being watched, hunted, like something was lurking in the shadows. Around midnight, something happened again, another loud crashing sound, like something was falling from the sky. We jumped up, trying to figure out what was happening, but we could not see anything in the darkness. After searching around for a while, trying to find the source of this noise that was driving us crazy, we noticed that one of our friends was missing. We called out to him, but he didn't answer. We searched the area around the campsite, but he was nowhere to be found. Now we were all scared and confused, not knowing what to do. As the night wore on, we all tried to sleep, but it was impossible. We could hear strange noises in the distance, and somehow we all managed to lose consciousness and fall into a deep sleep. The morning brought with it a sense of dread. We realized that our friend was still missing. We searched the area, calling out his name, but there was no answer. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. As we were searching, we could still hear a strange pulsating sound, but far from the distance now, sometimes growing louder and more intense. We followed the sound for what felt like hours, but we could not find the source. It was like the forest was controlling us, making us follow the sound, driving us to madness, leading us in circles, confusing us at every turn. And then, as we were about to give up, we heard a sound that chilled us to the bone. It was the sound of our missing friend, screaming in terror and pain. We rushed towards the sound, pushing our way through the dense forest, trying to find him. We saw him, lying on the ground, writhing in agony. We tried to help him, but he was in too much pain. And then, as we're trying to figure out what to do, we heard the sound again, the same pulsating, grinding sound that seemed to be coming from underground. We realized that we were in the middle of something we couldn't understand, something that was beyond our comprehension. We all felt like we were in the middle of a nightmare that we just could not escape. As the day wore on, we tried our best to help our friend, but he was beyond help. Screaming in pain, his body racked with convulsions, and as the sun began to set, he stopped moving. We realized that he had died. We were all overcome with grief, shock, and terror. 
It was like the forest had taken him, like he had become a sacrifice to some dark and terrible force. As we sat there in the middle of the forest, we could hear the sound again, that pulsating, grinding sound that seemed to be coming from underground. We all knew that something terrible was about to happen, that we were in the middle of a nightmare that was about to come to life. The death of our friend shook us to the very core, and we knew that we had to get out of the forest as soon as possible. We packed up our stuff and tried making our way back towards the car, our hearts heavy with grief and fear. As we hiked, we all noticed that the feelings worsened. Our headaches had intensified. We all began feeling far more nauseous. It was like the forest was trying to hold on to us, to keep us, like it was trying to ensnare us forever. And then, as we were about two miles away, something strange happened. We all began slowly experiencing severe hallucinations, seeing things that weren't there and hearing voices that were disembodied and strange. It was like the forest was toying with our minds, trying to drive us mad. We all began to lose our sense of direction. We became confused and overridden with fear and panic. We tried to retrace our steps, but it was no use. We were lost in the middle of the forest, with no way out. As the afternoon and evening wore on, we all began to feel worse. We all began bleeding from our nose, ears, and eyes. We were all experiencing fainting spells and disorientation. It was like the forest was alive and trying to consume us. As we stumbled, we heard a sound in the distance. It was the sound of chanting, multiple voices speaking in unison. We followed the sound, stumbling through the darkness. It was as if we were drawn to them, that some unseen force was controlling our bodies, pulling us closer to these sounds. When we came across another large clearing, fully illuminated by the moonlight. At this point, we had all, or so it feels like, completely lost any sense of direction, time, feeling, or memories. I can remember there were these strange figures, multiple of them in this clearing, far taller than any man I've ever seen, but they were so dark I can't remember much. I blacked out, and the next thing I remember was a blur of bright lights in my face and unfamiliar faces. We were in the hospital. The doctors and nurses tried to explain our condition, but we were far too gone to properly understand. We all had severe symptoms of radiation sickness, as well as a host of other bizarre illnesses that the doctors could not identify. We were continuing to bleed from our nose, ears, and eyes, and continuing to faint with low blood pressure. It was like we had been infected with something, something beyond our understanding, and as it turns out, the friend in which we thought died was actually alive, as he too was in the hospital bed next to us, but all three of us could have sworn he died as well. I'm not exactly sure how to explain this away. We tried to give our statements the best we could, considering the doctors and nurses and police were extremely concerned that these young men had such terrible, terrible symptoms. We told them exactly what we knew, and all of our stories matched up. They weren't sure what to make of it. Our recovery took quite a bit of time. In fact, all of us ended up with long-lasting symptoms we still cannot explain. Even now, almost 20 to 30 years later, I still have a hard time wrapping my mind around what happened in the Shawnee National Forest. I kept this story fairly private until recently, but I'm curious to hear anyone's speculation on what it could have been, what could have happened out there. Just when you think the woods are safe, here we are, proven wrong. I understand that the story I'm about to tell you probably won't make a whole lot of sense at first. In fact, I was very hesitant to even send this in, but it's an ongoing thing that has not stopped. So, my family has owned property in rural Oklahoma for many, many years now. It's near a small town. 
We have several acres of land that we use for cattle, horses, and other animals. We have had some strange things happen before, but nothing like this. I'll try to explain the best as I can. We have a very large field behind our house. It's about a half a mile wide and goes for about two miles. Our house is on the corner of two roads. One road goes straight into town and the other road goes straight into the field. We have a small creek that runs through our property. It's about 100 yards from the house and is about 100 yards away from the field. We have a lot of deer that come through our property, so it's not uncommon to see them. We've also seen wild hogs, coyotes, foxes, and other animals. We also have a small barn about 50 feet away from the field that we use for hay, storage, and cattle. So, it was late one night. I went outside to get some water. We have an old farmhouse, and it's very dark. We have a porch light, but I don't think it was turning on. I was looking at the stars. I'm out there for about 15 minutes, enjoying the night, just looking up, when I hear this very loud ear-piercing scream. I mean, this was loud. It came from the field. I'd say no more than 100 yards away. Now, I've heard coyotes and other animals make some weird noises, but nothing like this. I stood there for a few moments, trying to discern and figure out what it was. I thought maybe a coyote had gotten into the cattle pen because we have some calves in there. So I grabbed my shotgun and went to go check it out. Now when I got into the barn, I turned my light on. I could see the gate was closed. So whatever it was couldn't get into the pen. I went back to the house and just went back to bed. I did not think anything more about it. Now here's where it gets strange. The next morning, I went out to feed the horses. We have a very large pasture behind our house, and there's horses there. I went out to feed them and noticed the mares were acting strange, one in particular walking in circles and acting scared. I looked around to see what might be bothering her, but could not see anything. I went to the house and got some grain for her and started feeding it out in front of her she was still acting strange. Now, I've been around horses for a majority of my life, so when they act up, it usually means there is something bothering them. I started to walk around the pasture looking for anything out of place, but I didn't see anything. That's when I noticed something strange. There were these strange prints in the dirt. I looked closer. I don't know what they were. I've never seen tracks like these, so I took some pictures. I have no idea what made them. They were going in the same direction and almost looked like they were in a hurry. The whole ordeal left me with a very strange, uneasy feeling, still giving me goosebumps. Now at nighttime, the property just feels very eerie. It's a very unwelcoming feeling. And there's also times during the nights where the woods around you go silent. In the spring and summer, it's pretty alive with insects and noise, so that is extremely unusual. This is all in conjunction with strange animal behavior. Very recently, I went to this paranormal conference that I was recommended to go, and I showed some of these pictures to a few of these investigators. They believe that I have what they call a dogman on the property. Just wait, it gets even better. Apparently, Rural Oklahoma is a hotbed for these mysterious animals, and having all this livestock and deer around is just a massive food source. I'm not really sure what to believe, to be honest, but something's going on here. At the time of writing this, we're missing three calves that have disappeared in the last eight months alone. I'm looking for any advice. I've been a hunter my whole life, grew up in a small town in the rural Midwest, and there's nothing I love more than spending time in the woods. In fact, every year in October, I make a pilgrimage to a particularly remote section of the forest, about 12 miles from the nearest road, and set up my deer stand. The story in question begins, it was a beautiful day when I headed out. 
the sun was shining, the birds were chirping, and there was a crispness to the air that told me winter was well on its way. I was looking forward to spending a few days alone in solace in the woods, just me and the deer. I hiked deep in the woods, following the winding trails that I knew so well. The terrain was rough, but I was used to it. It had been coming to the spot for years, and I can navigate the woods blindfolded if I have to. Okay, well, maybe not that confidently, but you get what I'm trying to say. When I finally arrived at the clearing where I usually set up camp, I began unloading my gear, and it was right then and there that I heard a noise that still unsettles me. It was this guttural growling sound coming from the tree line. It made me stop what I was doing and look around, but I didn't see anything. So I shrugged it off and continued setting up my gear. Now, everything went pretty normal. The sun started to set, I built a small fire and settled in for the night. I couldn't shake the feeling though that something wasn't right. The woods were too quiet, too still. It was like the animals had all fled the area. I had heard the growl again, this time it was closer, and I could see movement now, movement through the trees with a very unnatural speed and grace, and like from going zero to 100, I saw them. I saw what appeared to be a pack of creatures moving in on me through the trees. Now, bear with me here when I say this, but what these things looked like, they looked like they were straight out of a Hollywood horror movie. They had shaggy fur, pointed ears, and jagged, horrible teeth. They were tall, lean, and more muscular than any wolf I'd ever seen. Their eyes were like glowing embers. I was frozen in terror as they approached my camp. I tried my best to make myself small, to blend in with the area around me, but it was no use. They had seen me. They were coming for me fast. And that was just the beginning of the five days of terror that would follow. The pack of these creatures, whatever they were, moved with an eerie synchronicity as they approached my camp. I could hear their growls and see their eyes glowing. I was paralyzed with fear, and I knew that I had to act fast as if I was going to survive. I grabbed my rifle, tried to take aim, but they were too fast. They darted in and out of the trees, always staying just out of reach of my bullets. I realized that I needed to get out of there, find a way to escape, but these things had me cornered. I knew that any attempt to run would be futile, so I did the only thing I could. I hunkered down and I waited. I prayed that they would lose interest and leave me alone, but they did not. These things circled my camp all night, snarling and making all sorts of horrible noises. But why weren't they coming in? Why weren't they attacking me? Maybe this was an intimidation tactic. I could hear their claws against the ground. I knew they were watching me, waiting for me to make a move. I tried to stay awake to keep watch, but exhaustion eventually overtook me, and I fell into a fitful sleep, my rifle by my side hoping that the morning would bring relief. When I woke up, they were still there. They had not left, and I knew that I was in for a long, terrifying ordeal. I spent the next few days trying to evade them. I would try and make a run for it. They would chase after, their eyes still glowing. I even attempted to climb a tree, and they would just claw at the trunk, trying to knock me down. I was outmatched, outgunned, I had no idea how to defend myself against these things. All I could do was try to stay alive. I tried to use my knowledge of the woods to my advantage. I would climb up rocky outcroppings or steep hills, hoping to put some distance between me and these things, but they were always right behind me. I tried to use my rifle, but it was no use. These things were too fast, far too agile. It's like they were able to dodge bullets with ease, and I knew that wasting precious ammunition was not worth it. The days wore on, I became increasingly desperate. I was quickly running out of food and water, and I knew I could not keep up this game of cat and mouse forever. 
Maybe they were far more intelligent than I can imagine. Maybe they got a sick thrill of playing cat and mouse with me till I ran out of options and nearly starved to death before they pounced on their prey. Maybe that's why they didn't attack me yet. I tried to make a fire one night, hoping to cook some food I had brought with me. I fleed with my life. They still pursued. They seemed to take pleasure in the hunt and the terror they were causing. It's almost like they were purposely prolonging my death. I never felt so alone, so helpless. But I refused to give up. I kept moving, kept trying to find a way out. I was determined, no matter what. I was lost, hungry and thirsty now. My feet were blistered. My legs were sore from running and climbing. I had no idea where I was, and I was quickly losing hope. I had always prided myself on my ability to navigate the woods, but now I was hopelessly turned around. I tried to use my compass and map, but they were no help. These things had chased me off course. I had no idea how to get back on track. It's almost like they were herding me in a specific direction. I was feeling like I was going crazy. The constant fear and adrenaline had taken their toll on my mind and body and exhaustion. I was jumpy, irritable. I found myself imagining things that weren't there. I even stumbled across a small stream. I had been without water for a day. I knelt down and drank deeply, feeling the cool water wash over me. It was like a bomb to my parched throat. But the relief was short-lived. As I drank, I heard the growling coming up. I looked and saw them watching me. I knew that I had to leave. I couldn't stay in one place for long. I was too weak, far too exhausted. I tried to find some shelter, to make a fire and wait out the night. But they found me. They always did. I was left exposed to the elements, no protection from the cold. I knew I was in serious trouble. I was lost, alone, and being hunted by unknown predators that I couldn't even begin to comprehend. I had no idea how I was going to make it out alive. I was at the end of my rope. I had been running and hiding for days. I was beginning to lose hope. I knew that I couldn't keep this up forever. Sooner or later, they would catch up to me, and I'd be all over. But something miraculous happened. I stumbled across a service road. It was like a beacon of hope in the midst of darkness. I could hardly believe my luck. I followed the road for miles, my heart pounding with excitement. I knew that I was getting closer to civilization, closer to safety. But these things were still out there, still hunting me. They were always just a few steps behind, their eyes glowing in the dark. I could still hear their noises, and I knew I was not out of danger yet. I tried to stay focused, to keep moving forward, but it was hard. I was exhausted, sore, weak, and hungry. The road stretched on forever. I saw lights of a town in the distance. I stumbled to the nearest gas station. How? I don't know. My clothes were torn. I was scratched, bleeding, almost on the verge of collapsing. I must have looked like a wild man. The people at the gas station were shocked to see me. They called the police and an ambulance, and I was quickly taken to the hospital. I was treated for dehydration and malnutrition, and I spent the next few days recovering. It took me a long time to process what had happened. I had never believed in the supernatural before, but now I have a different feeling about it. These things, whatever they were, had hunted me, and I survived. I still go hunting now, crazy, right? But I'm much more careful. I don't go into the woods alone and I always carry several weapons. I know that I can never let my guard down again. The real question here is how long were these things going to chase me for? Were they just letting me go until I was weak and going to die? Or were they just playing a game? The same game that a cat plays with a mouse before it finally grows bored of that game and devours it. I'm glad I never found out. As I sit here reflecting on my life, 
I can't help but think about that fateful backpacking trip to Mount Shasta in 1979. Every year, my friend Jim and I would take a trip to a remote location to disconnect from the world and bask in the beauty of nature. That year, we chose Mount Shasta as our destination. Jim was a tall, lanky guy with a smile that could light up any room. He was an avid outdoorsman, and his love for nature was infectious. I, on the other hand, was a short, stocky guy who was not as physically fit as Jim. However, I had a deep sense of spirituality, and I believed that nature was God's way of showing us his power and majesty. After a grueling day of hiking, we finally arrived at our campsite. We quickly set up our tent and started a campfire. We planned on spending the next few days fishing and hiking the trails all around the mountain. As the sun began to set, we sat around the campfire, telling stories and reminiscing about old times. The night was filled with laughter and joy. I remember feeling grateful for the friendship I had with Jim. Little did I know, our trip was about to take a terrifying turn. As the night sky grew darker, Jim and I decided to get our fishing gear and head to a nearby creek. We were both avid fishermen and we had high hopes of catching some trout for dinner. As we made our way through the forest, I started feeling uneasy. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I tried to brush it off as just my imagination, but the feeling persisted. My eyes caught something near the tree line. A large, no, a giant figure that seemed to be covered in dark hair. My heart raced as I realized we were not alone. Whatever animal this was had to have been at least eight feet tall with broad shoulders and massive arms. Its eyes were small and deep set. Its face was mostly hidden behind what I would describe as a thick, woolly beard. It was like nothing I'd ever seen. My mind struggled to make sense of what was in front of me. My fear turned into panic. I realized we were trapped. I tried to run, but my feet felt like they were glued to the ground. I was frozen in place, staring at the creature in terror. As a devout Catholic, I turned to prayer. I closed my eyes, reciting the Lord's Prayer, hoping that God would protect us from this mysterious creature. Suddenly, the creature's expression changed. It didn't seem aggressive or threatening. In fact, it looked curious, almost as if it was studying us. As I opened my eyes, I saw the creature slowly fade away into a wispy mist. I couldn't believe what I just witnessed, and I was shaking with fear and confusion. I fled back to our campsite, trying to catch my breath. When I told Jim what had happened, he seemed skeptical at first, but as he looked at my face, he realized that something had scared me. That's when he revealed that he had seen the same creature earlier in the day, but he had assumed it was just a bear. We both realized that we were not alone in the forest, and we were being watched by something we could not explain. Our plans for the trip were now thrown into complete disarray. We were too scared to stay in the area, and we decided to pack up our things and start hiking back down the mountain. As we hiked down the mountain, our minds were racing with questions about what we had just experienced. We couldn't believe that we had seen something so incredible and terrifying at the same time. As we walked, we kept glancing over our shoulders, half expecting what we saw to reappear, but it never did. Eventually, we made our way back. We drove to a nearby town and got some grub and rest. We were both exhausted from the hike and the emotional toll that this had taken on us. As we sat in a small podunk diner, we discussed what we had seen. We tried to make sense of the appearance, but we couldn't come up with any logical explanation. Perhaps it was a mutated bear. Maybe it was a bear with mange. The more we talked, the more we realized that this bear seemed to be curious, almost as if it was studying us. We both felt a sense of awe and wonder at what we had experienced, 
despite the fear and panic that had accompanied it. When we got back to our hometown, we told our families about the encounter. They were skeptical, but as they saw the fear and confusion that we both wore on our faces, they realized we were not making it up. Months went by. We tried to move on, but the memory lingered and persisted. We could not shake the feeling that we had witnessed something truly paranormal. Now, it wasn't until a few years later that we had our next breakthrough. Jim and I were at a family gathering. We began talking to our cousin, who was actually a park ranger in a nearby national park. We described the creature. Our cousin's eyes widened in recognition. He told us that there had been reports of similar sightings in the area, and the creature was commonly known as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. You have to understand that in 1979, even though the concept of Bigfoot was starting to become known, it still wasn't really accepted, not like it is now. And I had not seen the Patterson film just yet at this time. Not to mention, the Mount Shasta area, I would learn later, is a hotbed for encounters. While we couldn't confirm whether or what we had seen was indeed Bigfoot, we were relieved to know that we were not the only ones who had experienced something strange in that area. It was a moment of reunion and validation. It gave us a sense of closure and peace. Our lives were never quite the same. We became fascinated with the phenomenon of Bigfoot. We tried to read every book and article we can find on the subject. We went on expeditions to search for evidence, but we never found anything conclusive. The encounter has also had an impact on our worldview. There are things this life can't explain and that we need to be more open-minded about mysteries. We also struggled with the aftermath. We were both plagued by nightmares and anxiety. We found it hard to shake off the feeling that we were being watched any time we went in the woods. It was as if that encounter had marked us. But as time went on, we learned to cope with the experience. We realized that we had witnessed something incredible and that we were lucky to have had the moment of connection with the natural world. The encounter also brought us closer together. We had been through something profound and life-changing. We knew we could always rely on one another for support and understanding. As we grew older, we started to share our story with others, trying to spread awareness about the mysteries of the unspoken world. We hoped that our story would inspire others who are more curious and open-minded. Looking back, the encounter with this thing had a profound impact. It challenged our beliefs, expanded our spiritual horizons, and brought us closer together than we can imagine. It was a moment we would never forget, and it's now become a part of my life's history and legacy.